Good morning, everyone. My name is Ted House. I am a partner uh, in Mayor Brown's New York office and the head of the firm's U.S. international arbitration practice. I'm joined today by uh, Hannah Banks and Joseph Otu, who are both uh, uh, members of our international arbitration practice. Uh, Hannah is in New York with me, and Joseph is in London. Um, before we begin, just a few housekeeping announcements. First, as we go along, you know, you should please feel free to uh, ask us questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll see the questions. We, we, we may answer them when they come up. We may wait to the end to answer them. But in any case, if we were unable to answer your questions during uh, the presentation, we will follow up with you uh, after the webinar has ended. Second. Uh, this is a CLE credited presentation, so we will provide we will be providing a uh, the CLL alpha numeric code at some point during the presentation. Uh, and in order to receive CLE credits, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Uh, finally, one caveat I need to at, uh, need to state is that our views expressed today are our own and should not be attributed to our firm or to our clients. So with that legal caveat, let's get started. As, as noted, this, this seminar, uh, this presentation is titled Drafting Dispute Resolution Provisions to Avoid International Disputes. In other words, when you're no negotiating an international commercial transaction, what can you do in terms of drafting a dispute resolution provision to decrease the risk of an, of an international legal proceeding, or if one happens, decrease the expense of that proceeding? I will say here, I would like to state here that we are not transactional attorneys. We are international arbitration attorneys. That said, we routinely, we routinely draft, we routinely draft uh, international arbitration provisions and other dispute resolution provisions for international contracts for our commercial colleagues. And more important than that, we, uh, our experience uh, conducting international dispute proceedings, international arbitration proceedings, gives us a perspective on what types of dispute resolution provisions work, and perhaps more importantly, what types of provisions do not work. You know, I've been doing this for uh, uh, over 25 years now, and I've seen all kinds of international arbitration clauses, and I know firsthand the kind of troubles that a client can face if the transactional lawyers do not take the time up front to draft an effective uh, international arbitration provision. The good news, it's not, the good news is it's not complicated uh, to uncomplicate uh, a future dispute. But uh, you have to uh, take the time up front, and, um, and we hope that this presentation helps you get to that. So what are today's topics? Um, first, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the, the first choice you have to make when you're, when you're uh, drafting uh, an international commercial dispute resolution provision. Are you going to do litigation, or are you going to call for international arbitration? Um, obviously, this is a critical choice. And uh, as I will discuss, if you choose the wrong one, you could end up in a situation where you may not have an enforceable dispute resolution mechanism at all. Uh, and without an enforceable dispute, rec me dispute resolution mechanism, disputes may never be resolved, much less avoided. And Without an enforceable dispute resolution mechanism, settlement becomes almost impossible. Who's going to settle something when there's no real threat of, a, of enforceable legal proceeding? And you may end up uh, uh, in several different forums. You'll, you'll sue in one forum. The other side will sue in another forum or bring an arbitration. So it's, this, is, this is a very important choice, and that will be the first topic of our presentation. The second topic, uh, which Hannah will be handling deals with uh, how to draft a workable uh, and not merely enforceable international arbitration clause. And I, I just want to define what workable means up front. An enforceable clause is okay. You need an enforceable clause, but it's not enough. Uh, there are other provisions you need to add into an international arbitration clause 
in order to make it, in order to avoid costly procedural disputes up front uh, and increase the predictability of the proceeding. Finally, Joseph will handle the subject of optional provisions to, dec to decrease the risk and expense of international arbitration. And these are provisions that can be applied on a case-by-case -case basis, and we, we are, Joseph is going to be focusing on those that will, again, hopefully decrease the risk of a proceeding starting, or at the very least, decrease the expense of that proceeding once it does start. So let's talk about litigation versus arbitration. And this slide is titled Advantages of Arbitration Over Litigation in International Commercial Disputes. I'm going to go through them. The first three that you see on your screen, speed, cost, privacy, confidentiality, expertise, quality of the decision makers, those are all nice. Those are all nice uh, features of international arbitration, but they're not the most important, by far not the most important. It's true that uh, international arbitration can be cheaper than litigation. There's no appeal process, but it's not guaranteed. International arbitration can be expensive, uh, so that should not be your primary concern. Uh, confidentiality and privacy, uh, and this, it's nice. Uh, all arbitrations are private in the sense that the public cannot come in and watch them like a court proceeding. But just a, uh, just a heads up, not all international arbitrations are confidential. Uh, many international arbitration rules, including the ICC rules, do not provide for confidentiality. So uh, confidentiality is not an assured uh, uh, feature of international arbitration. It is something that you have to look at the rules you choose, and if the confidentiality is not in the rules, the international arbitration rules that you choose, you have to write it into your provision. Uh, quality uh, expertise of the decision makers. Look, there are, I, this is almost a toss up. There are good judges, there are bad judges. I have seen a lot of very good arbitrators. I've seen some pretty bad arbitrators. Um, but I guess the one difference here is that with litigation, it's pretty much the luck of the draw. You get the judge that you're assigned. With arbitration, you do have some uh, uh, ability to choose the individuals who will be deciding, the arbitrators who will be deciding the case. But let, let's go on to the last two, neutrality and enforceability. They're, they're the most important, uh, enforceability being the most important. And let, let me explain. But let's talk about neutral, neutrality first. You have an international dispute contract. You're, just, you're, you're negotiating it, say, on behalf of a U.S. client against a French client. Um, the, the U.S. client doesn't want to be in the French courts if a dispute arises under the contracts. The French client doesn't want to be before a U.S. jury, understandably, so they agree to arbitration. Uh, so what does that provide? It provides for neutrality. First of all, it provides for a neutral playing field in the sense that the arbitration is usually conducted in a neutral country. So to continue that example, uh, maybe, the, maybe the arbitration clause between a French company and a U.S. company would provide for arbitration in London or Switzerland. Uh, more important, it provides for a neutral decision maker. Uh, the, if it's one arbitrator, most arbitration rules require that the decision maker be of a nationality other than the parties. So in this case, it wouldn't be a French arbitrator. It wouldn't be a uh, a U.S. arbitrator, it might be an English arbitrator or a Swiss arbitrator. And in case there's a three arbitration panel, a three arbitrator panel, which is more common, um, each side gets to pick their own arbitrator. Maybe the French side picks a French arbitrator. Maybe the U.S. side picks a U.S. arbitrator, but the president of the tribunal, the chairwoman or chairperson or chairman, will be of a neutral nationality. So you have neutral decision making uh, on a national scale. Most important, and this is, uh, if there's anything you could take away from the presentation today, I think it's this, is enforceability. There is a treaty called the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. It's a treaty dating back to 1958. It's been a stupendously successful treaty. There's maybe uh, 160 nations, most of the world, have ratified this treaty. The treaty does two things. First, when you sign on to the treaty, when a nation signs on to the treaty, it agrees that if one of its citizens agrees in writing to arbitrate with a foreign company, with a foreign entity, and then tries to sue that foreign entity in the courts, the courts are treaty bound to throw the case out. They say, 
to the front, for example, to continue with my example, uh, thank you uh, to the French citizen. You can't sue the American citizen because you agreed to arbitration, and we're not going to even entertain this lawsuit. Second, and probably more important, is that all, when you sign on, when all these countries sign on to the New York Convention, they agreed that if there is an arbitration judgment, it's called an arbitration award, against one of your citizens, and your citizen refuses to pay it, and the other side comes to the courts to try to enforce it against you, the courts are treaty bound to enforce the award without looking under the award. There are some limited exceptions to that, but the, the bottom line is this, uh, and I think it's easiest to take an example, uh, and let's continue with the same example I've been giving. French, you go through an arbitration against a French company. You win a million dollars against the French company. The arbitrators award a million dollars. The arbitrators cannot enforce force the uh, French company to pay the million dollars. Uh, they don't have the power of the state. So you and and the French company, let's say the French company says, no, I'm not going to pay it. Well, then you take that arbitration award. You walk into a French court and you say, a French judge, here's the arbitration award. Please attach the assets of the French company, the bank accounts, et cetera, located in France so I can be satisfied and, and get the money that I was awarded. Uh, that That is that that is the. The, that is the essence and really the, the linchpin of international arbitration in international dispute resolutions. There is no comparable treaty for the enforcement of court judgments abroad. So when is litigation safe uh, or so I say safeish for international commercial disputes? Um, there are, some, uh, there are some treaties between countries that do allow for the enforcement of court judgments uh, bilateral treaties, multilateral treaties, nothing like the New York Convention. Uh, but for example, in the EU, uh, there's the, the, in the EU treaty, members of the EU, a, li a judgment in one nation is enforceable in the courts of another nation. Okay, but that's very limited. Uh, there is, in some, uh, some cases, there is established record of, of comity between nation courts. So for example, uh, the English courts may be very good about treating American court judgments uh, with respect and given a comedy, but it's it's not for sure. You don't know that for sure, and are, we, are you willing to take the risk? Because the English courts, for example, are not treaty bound to enforce U.S. court judgments. They're, they're, they give it some deference, but they, they are not treaty bound. So you're in a situation where you may have a litigation, win against uh, the English citizen, go into the English courts, don't enforce it. Uh, a, third, a third time that litigation is safe for international disputes uh, is when your adversary has fixed sufficient assets available for attachment in the litigation forum. So if, for example, you, you agree to litigation with a French company and you know the French company has factories in the U.S. that you know will be there uh, and there'll be a sufficient amount of money to satisfy a future dispute, well, then if you win a litigation judgment, you can enforce it against those factories and you don't, have to wor you don't have to worry about that. But the question is, how do you know that? Uh, how do you know that, there's gonna, that, there, that the, the assets will be there two years from now in the arbitration, when the litigation's over? How do you know that they're gonna be sufficient? So that's a, that's a, that is also a risk that you take. Uh, three, other, uh, three other situations, money's in escrow, the purchase price holdback provision, for example. Um, uh, that's the rare case. Uh, and you know, are the funds sufficient uh, to cover, uh, to allow the enforcement of a litigation judgment in the future? That's a question you have to ask. Um, next, no chance you'll be the plaintiff. Um, well, if there's no chance you'll be the plaintiff, you don't have to enforce anything, right? So make them chase you in your home court, it's fine to agree to litigation. But how are you going to, how are you going to predict that? That's something you really got to consider. How do you predict that? I mean, uh, you never know, you may have to be the claimant. Well, for example, if you're the seller rather than the buyer, you're more likely to be the defendant. If you're the larger company with more money, you're more likely to be defended. But again, it's impossible to predict that with 100% accuracy. So again, there's a certain risk that you're taking. Lastly, I just refer to um, two other instances, jurisdictions that don't enforce international arbitration awards. And I split them up into two. One is non-signatories to the New York Convention. So again, those countries that haven't signed on, they're not treaty bound to enforce international arbitration awards. Um, in that case, 
litigation judgments are just as unenforceable as our international arbitration awards are just as unenforceable as litigation judgments. Um, that's, so in that case, you may even have to consider agree, agreeing to litigate in the courts of your adversary if that's the best thing you can do. Um, the next, I, and I put this down, are I call them renegade signatories. Obviously, some countries are better at adhering to treaty obligations than others. Um, it's easier to enforce an international arbitration award in Switzerland than it is in China or Russia. But it's maybe the only game in town, or the best of several evils, because uh, if, for example, you're doing a transaction with a Chinese company, I don't think you want to be in the Chinese courts. And if you have a U.S. court, if you agree to U.S. litigation, the Chinese courts are not going to give deference to a U.S. court judgment. So international arbitration, while it has its limitations, uh, it, it may be the, the best game in town. Let's continue. Um, let's talk about, and I'll assume you are going to agree to international arbitration. You, you agreed to that um, instead of litigation. The, the, this section of our presentation, we want to discuss what do you put in the clause to make it not merely enforceable, but also workable, as I, just, as I defined earlier, to make it a, a, a system, a, a procedure that will avoid procedural disputes up front and limit the costs for your client. The dangers of drafting, the dangers of a poorly drafted international arbitration clause are very significant. It, most significantly, it may preclude arbitration jurisdiction altogether. Arbitrators get their jurisdiction entirely from the party's agreement, right? So if the party's agreement is defective, it doesn't, it doesn't effectively give the arbitrators that authority. The arbitrators don't have that authority. At the very least, it will lead to court challenge, a poorly drafted international arbitration clause will lead to court challenges and added legal fees. And Hannah will discuss some of this, but there could be uh, disputes about the clause. Then you go to the courts, and maybe the courts in the end say, well, the clause is enforceable, but then you spent a year and lots of fees getting to that point. Uh, third, reduces pr predictability of the arbitration dispute. That's a, basically a corollary of the above. And last, um, it jeopardizes the chances of successfully enforcing the award, which is what I was getting to earlier, that uh, you may go through a situation where you get it, you go all the way to the end, have an arbitration, and the other side challenges the jurisdiction of the arbitrator because the, the, the clause was drafted uh, improperly. And then you have to go to your client and say, well, I got good news and bad news. We won the arbitration, but because the arbitration clause was drafted poorly, we can't enforce the arbitration award. And you don't want to be in that situation. Let me br very briefly discuss what is necessary for an enforceable clause. And then Hannah is going to talk about what, is, what we believe is necessary to, be, to make an enforceable clause um, workable. This is the bare minimum. An arbitration clause has to state the scope of the dispute to be arbitrated. Okay? Uh, it, 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 and, our, and our advice is except in rare circumstances, the clause should cover any and all disputes arising under the contract. So this will cover contract claims, it'll cover tort claims in connection with the contract, and it gives the arbitrators broad jurisdiction. A piecemeal clause where you give some, uh, you, 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 get, you uh, assign some disputes to litigation and other disputes to arbitration is often a recipe for chaos, at least in my experience. Resourceful uh, defendants will make up all sorts of arguments as to why a particular claim is not within the jurisdiction of the arbitrator, it should be in within the jurisdiction of the court. And, and even, if it's, you know, even if it's totally wrong, they can create a lot of mischief and a lot of costs while you're arguing that up front. So it's always safest to give the arbitrators broad jurisdiction. Uh, secondly, arbitration has to be an exclu exclusive dispute resolution mechanism, okay? Our, again, arbitrators get their get their uh, authority from contracts. So if they, if they don't have the absolute exclusive authority to decide a particular dispute, they can't decide, decide that dispute. And here I just want to uh, note the distinction between may and shall, and this is something that I've noticed a lot in defective arbitration clauses. You'd say, and if a dispute arises under the contract, the parties may 
uh, the dispute may be, may be submitted to arbitration. Well, that doesn't give the arbitrator exclusive uh, jurisdiction. And in fact, it doesn't give the arbitrator jurisdiction at all. It can be challenged in the courts. So you want to say, in the event there is a dispute under this contract, the dispute shall be settled by arbitration. Lastly, reference to arbitration rules. Now, if you agree to a litigation, if you agree to litigation, it comes with rules, right? We all know that. You agree to litigate in the federal courts, you have the federal rules of civil procedure. Not the case with arbitration. With arbitration, you have to refer to procedural rules that are going to govern the arbitration. And here you have two, uh, two choices. The first choice is to uh, adopt the rules of a particular international arbitration organization, such as the ICC or the LCIA, these, and then they have the rules, and these will come with the arbitration. The other is to do an ad hoc arbitration, which is an arbitration which is not administered, by the international arbitration organization like the ICC or the ICDR, um, and then you kind of write, have to write the rules into the arbitration clause itself or adopt the UNCTRAL rules. It's a little off topic for this presentation, but I generally strongly recommend going with procedural rules. If you don't have an institution to administer the arbitration, sometimes if there's a dispute between the parties, it ends up in the courts and it can slow things down. So it, it, unless, unless you really have to avoid ad hoc arbitration, my opinion. Now, each international arbitration organization puts out what they call a model for arbitration clause. And so if you go to the ICC website or the ICDR website, you'll see that these are the model clauses that they put up. Now, these model clauses are the bare minimum. What I just said. Look at look at the ICC. All disputes arising out of or in connection with the present contract, right? That's the first. What I just said. That's the scope of the dispute. Shall exclusive jurisdiction be finally settled under the rules of arbitration for the International Chamber of Commerce? It's the rules. So you have the three bare minimum requirements for an arbitration clause to be enforceable. Not enough. Not enough. And if, if you just do it this way, you may have, end up in courts, you may have, end up with extra expense. Uh, so I am now going to turn over to Hannah to explain what other clauses can be added to an international arbitration provision to make it workable. Thanks, Ted. Um, so as Ted mentioned, um, we are going to go through now some additional clauses that can be placed into your arbitration provision that will help, one, add clarity to the arbitration process, and two, uh, reduce the cost associated with that process. Um, we recommend that these provisions, that these clauses be included in every arbitration clause that you draft. And the information that we recommend that you include is, one, the place or situs of the arbitration, to the number of arbitrators that will decide the dispute and the procedures for how you select those arbitrators. Three, what language, uh, the language of the arbitration. Um, and the rest, the remaining three are provisions that we recommend you include. Um, the entry of judgment stipulation, a provision for provisional or injunctive relief, and a waiver of appeal provision. Um, again, it's easy to put the language in to make an arbitration clause enforceable, but including these, um, these six clauses, which we will discuss in turn, will help make the process efficient. So first, it's important to include the situs of the arbitration. This is a very simple clause to include in an arbitration provision. It's one sentence basically saying the place of the arbitration shall be fill in the blank. Um, although this is very simple, the consequences of not including the sentence can be great. Um, essentially, if it's not included in your arbitration clause, you can guarantee that there is going to be a dispute about where the arbitration should be held. And this is going to add significant expense at the beginning of your um, at the beginning of your arbitration. You can choose a location anywhere in the world, regardless of the particular rules you adopt. Uh, for example, the ICC, which is largely based in Paris, 
if you choose to have an arbitration under the ICC rules, that does not preclude you from having an arbitration, from having the actual CITES be New York or London or Singapore or anywhere else. Um, and while this is a simple provision to draft, there are complex strategic considerations behind the decisions in this clause. First, as Ted mentioned earlier, you likely want a neutral third-party country, um, and it's likely that this, the parties will agree to a neutral third-party country unless your client has some special bargaining power and you can negotiate a home country arbitration, which will give you the home court advantage. Two, uh, as Ted mentioned, you want to choose a CITES in a country that is a signatory to the New York Convention. This will be important for enforcement purposes and for keeping the courts uh, from interfering with the arbitration. You also want a country who, in addition to being a signatory to the New York Convention, has a modern arbitration statute and a reliable judicial system. Why is this important? Um, as stated, you don't want courts interfering with the arbitration process, and you want courts to follow the tenets of the New York Convention. At least in the, UNE in the United States, it's the Federal Arbitration Act that codifies the, um, the New York Convention and prohibits courts from interfering. The existence of an arbitration statute and reliable judicial system means that if there is a problem and you end up in front of the court, there is going to be a history in that country of recognizing arbitration procedures and disputes, and it's going to be more likely that the court is going to do what you want it to do and avoid interfering in the process of the arbitration itself. So what are some popular and reliable locations? Not surprisingly, Paris, New York, London, Geneva, Singapore, Hong Kong, Toronto, et cetera, really anywhere in Europe or in most of the Americas. Uh, you want to avoid developing countries in addition to some other countries. And as mentioned, that's really because you want to be in a place that has a strong history of arbitration and developed law on these issues. You don't want the court to be deciding an issue relating to your arbitration for the first time, you want it to be established in that country that the court should stay out of the arbitration process. Another consideration is that you wanna choose a country from which you would want the chairman or chairwoman of the tribunal to be selected. This is not necessary, but in the event that the parties are not able to agree to a chair, um, some institutions will appoint an, uh, the chair of the tribunal and they will frequently decide uh, on a chair that is from the um, situs of the arbitration. Uh, last but not least, obviously you want a country with the infrastructure necessary to support the arbitration. Moving on to the next clause, the number of arbitrators and the procedures for selecting them. Uh, the decision here is really, do you want one arbitrator or do you want three arbitrators? We generally recommend a panel of three arbitrators. Uh, you know, for one, for one thing, it reduces the chance of arbitrary decisions when you have three people contributing. Um, but it also reduces the chance of corruption. Um, and this doesn't always happen. Uh, arbitrators usually abide by high ethical standards. But you want balance on your tribunal. Um, as Ted mentioned, if one party appoints an arbitrator from their home country, the other party appoints an arbitrator from their home country, and the chair is from a neutral party, that adds some balance. Um, especially if this is a big dispute, I don't think you want to put all of your eggs in one basket. That being said, there are some advantages to choosing one arbitrator. Uh, it reduces the cost of the arbitration, and the arbitrator is less likely to split the baby. In terms of selecting the arbitrators, the selection procedures are governed by arbitration rules unless the arbitration clause specifies otherwise. For example, the ICC rules provide that the ICC appoints the chair unless the parties agree otherwise on the procedure. 
and you would include this information in the arbitration clause itself. Uh, generally, we recommend giving the parties rather than the ICC or the party appointed arbitrators control over choosing the sole arbitrator um, or the chair of the tribunal. And below you have a sample arbitration provision. As you can see, it provides that each party shall select one arbitrator and that the parties will then attempt to agree on a third within 20 days of confirmation of the second. Barring if they're not able to decide on one, then for example, the ICC can appoint the chair. Language of the arbitration. There is a real danger in not specifying the language of the arbitration. There can often be very heated bilingual disputes, which will add to really a phenomenal additional expense. Um, and it is quite simple to specify the language of the arbitration. Really all you have to say is the arbitration shall be conducted exclusively in, for example, the English language. Um, it is important to avoid dual language arbitrations. If you find yourself involved in a dual language arbitration, essentially this means that every submission to the, arbit to the tribunal has to be translated. And additionally, potentially all testimony will have to be done in both languages. This understandably you know, can double the cost of a hearing or of, um, close to double the cost of the arbitration. It's important not to assume that the language of the contract will be the language of the arbitration. For example, the ICC uh, provides that where the clause doesn't specify the language, the arbitrators can decide. And while they can take into account the language of the contract, that's not necessarily binding. Um, and again, if this has been agreed to ahead of time, the parties are going to enter disputes about this at the outset of the arbitration. So just be wary of that um, and avoid the cost up front. So next we have the entry of judgment stipulation. This is a simple provision. Um, any judgment rendered by the arbitrators may be, entered in any, may be entered in any court having jurisdiction, including a court having jurisdiction over any of the parties or their assets. It's crucial to include this information about the assets because you may want to enforce the award somewhere where your party is not located, but where they have enough money to satisfy the judgment. And just, uh, just I'm sorry, I'm just to interrupt there. It, with the New York Convention, uh, you you can not only, as I said, you can enforce the arbitration award anywhere in the world. Um, that where the signatory, where the country is a signatory to the New York Convention. So, enforcement means where their assets are located or where the parties are located. So, thanks, Ted. Moving on to provisional and injunctive relief. Uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, arbitrators are allowed to issue preliminary and permanent injunctive relief. They're um, not limited to just awarding monetary damages. Uh, there are two significant limitations on injunctions and arbitration. First is timing. Parties can't obtain injunctions at the beginning of a dispute before the tribunal is selected. As we just saw, there is a process for appointing the tribunal, um, and this takes time. And at the beginning of the arbitration is, is usually where um, injunctive relief is most necessary. You want to stop a party from disposing of its assets or get an order saying that a company has to continue supplying you with a product necessary to your business. Um, and if it's important to get that injunctive relief right at the outset, it's going to be difficult if you have to wait until the tribunal is appointed and constituted. Second, um, enforcement. Arbitrators lack the power of the state to enforce, enforce preliminary injunctions. And this means that you're going to have to go to the court if the parties refuse to abide by this preliminary injunction. The solution here um, is really quite simple. Arbitration clauses should preserve the party's right to seek a court injunction in aid of arbitration. Uh, and we'll discuss how that clause should look in a minute. Um, I should say there is one alternative to carving out um, 
injunctive relief, seeking injunctive relief in aid of arbitration. And that is that some arbitral institutions, such as the ICC um, and others, have recently developed inter emergency arbitrator provisions under these rules. Um, it's a relatively recent development, and there are some pros and cons. Uh, what these provisions do is essentially before the tribunal is constituted, they allow for the appointment of an arbitrator to hear the issue quickly and make decisions on a tight time frame. Uh, there are some problems with this, though. Typically, this emergency arbitrator will issue orders, not awards. Uh, that raises some issues of enforceability uh, dependent on the jurisdiction. Um, hopefully, the party complies with the order, but this isn't a guarantee, and you might end up in court fighting anyway. Uh, one pro is that your dispute will be all within the arbitral institution, but at this point in time, uh, it's not clear that that's worth it, given the cons. So here you can see an example of um, a provision for injunctive relief. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip over that, but you can see that the second part carves out uh, for any court of competent jurisdiction um, the ability to award provisional or preliminary relief. Um, another point that's important to consider is when you're drafting this clause, you want to make sure that this is a non-exclusive grant of jurisdiction to the court because you may want to seek injunctive relief not just where the party is located or where the proceedings are happening, but where any property in question is located. Finally, the waiver of appeal clause. This is quite simple. Um, it's not essential, but it is recommended uh, just because it brings clarity to the parties and might make, um, some, might make a party think twice before bringing a claim. Um, this provision states, you know, any award rendered by the arbitrators shall be final and binding on the parties, and that each party waives to the fullest extent possible their um, right to appeal or collaterally attack the award. Again, not essential, but it will help bring some clarity to the situation and may cause the parties to think twice before bringing a frivolous claim. And with that, I will turn it over to Joseph. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. So, um, my section is, is, is looking at optional provisions to decrease the risk and expense of international arbitration. Now, you've seen, um, when, when we have a look at these uh, international arbitration calls, you've seen the many considerations and complexities uh, which you have to really, really look into and satisfy yourself that you're comfortable with when you're when you're drafting these clauses. And what essentially what we mean, what we mean here, what, what we're trying to get at is is, is best practice for your, for, for your arbitration clause and for your arbitration. Um, you want your arbitration to be um, to, to be effective. So you, you, you get to the point where you've got an enforceable award, but also you want it to be efficient. You want to decrease the costs as much as possible and make sure that the costs are proportionate to, 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 to the dispute, uh, to, the, to the amount in dispute. <clears throat> now, the first thing I'm going to... First thing I'm going to talk about is um, deadlines and time limits. Now, all of the issues I talk about in this section really, really, really speak to best practice and really speak to you trying to un understand what type of dispute you have, understand how to get the, the best out of your uh, ar arbitration. And you know, all all of these things are uh, can be addressed on a case by case basis. But there are some best practice and, and and some really effective guidelines that you can you you can try and, and follow. So the first thing, time, deadlines and, and, and time limits. Now, the instinct is in international arbitration, especially when you think you have a good case, to try and have aggressive deadlines and aggressive timeline. We want, we want our award as quickly as possible, but we, we, we're losing money uh, and we've been put out of money and we want, we want the other side to pay for it. Now, while that's an understandable instinct, it's, um, it's probably not the best approach to have. It might seem like a good idea, but an inflexible timeline can can, can really cause both parties problems, um, because any any deadline that's that that's not met could lead lead to court challenges. 
Um, so really, what we're saying here is that well, what, you have to have reasonable, have a reasonable deadline, but also have provide some flexibility. Allow um, the, 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 the tribunal to, to have discretion so that you can ask for an extension if you need, if you need to. You want the case to be properly decided, um, and you don't want any challenge in relation to one, due process issues, so one party hasn't had the opportunity to, 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 to submit, their, to submit the, the issues in, in, in their case. And, and, and the problem really it goes to, and the real risk is goes to the, effective, the effectiveness of the arbitration. Now, if, a, if, a, if you have a strict deadline, um, uh, if one of the parties misses that deadline or the arbitration tribunal miss, miss, miss also misses a deadline, then there may, it may impact on, on the tribunal's jurisdiction when it comes to enforcement. If the if, if the parties agree that um, it, something should be submitted or uh, at a certain date and it's not submitted at a certain date, then it opens up um, a risk of a one party or the other cha cha challenging um, cha challenging this. So what we've got on the slide there is an example of a clause that you might want to to, to put into your um, a, 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 a contract. To, to ensure that the, the, there's some flexibility with, 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 with timings and deadlines. Now, I won't, I won't, I won't go through, through, the, through the clause because um, uh, we've got quite a lot to cover in this section. But just so that you, you know that there's, there's, there are some, there are, there, are, there is a way in which you can try and um, adopt some flexibility and, and write this into the contract so the, so, so you're protected from any. Um, any issue when it comes to enforcement of the award or any criticism that one one party or the other um, ha didn't have ha have the chance to to, um, to to put their case properly and effectively. Hmm. Now the second slide relates to um, summary disposition of procedures, and what that really relates to is giving the, the, the arbitru, arbitru, arbitral tribunal the opportunity to dispose of a claim or part of a claim. Now, in international arbitra ab arbitrations, generally arbitrators are not permitted to issue a summary judgment um, ruling, um, even where one party is, is, is entitled to a judgment as a matter of law. And that all goes also to do with the due, due process. The parties agree to, to take, the, take, take, take the matter to, to, to an arbitration, and that arbitration needs to, to go its full course. So what's the issue here? So the unavailability of, of a summary, just summary disposition procedure can, can really be addressed um, through the drafting of an arbitration clause, because the general position is that any order is subject to a tribunal's final adjudication. So it's basically it's a provisional order generally tribunals are empowered to give, not final orders. But when you have a, a claim which you think should be um, sh should be adjudicated quickly and, and earlier, and you want the, the, tri the tribunal to come to a definitive answer early on, so you're not spending the cost of go taking um, a claim, one or two claims, through to um, through to a full hearing. Then you want to empower the the, tr the tribunal to, to provide um, uh, to, to provide the, uh, that um, disposition um, and, and to decide and give a summary um, decision. And so we've got a tribunal. Um, we, 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 if we've got a tribunal considering that, then we've got some some wording in there on the slide, which which will which will allow the tribunal to give um, to, 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 to give a, 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 a decision which is final and binding. So you don't have to go um, to a final merits hearing. So just looking at this clause very, very quickly, um, we, we say the arbitral tribunal shall have the authority to hear and determine in a preliminary phase of the arbitration any issue of law asserted by a party to be dispositive in whole or in part of any claim. So essentially, we're empowering the tribunal to, 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 to rule on particular claims and to, to, to dispose of them early on in the proceedings. And that essentially is what that clause is for. Because in international arbitration, you don't have a, a, the, the tribunal doesn't have a, a general um, power to do so. You have to think about this and, and write it into your contract. So the next slide I'm going to look at 
is negotiation or mediation as a precondition to arbitration. Now, this can, tends to be quite um, quite popular, and what, what they call, sometimes people call them hybrid clauses or tiered dispute resolution clauses. And, and essentially, what this provides for is um, for an arbitration clause, which provides that the parties have to go to um, mandatory negotiation, conciliation, or mediation of their dispute prior to commencing arbitration. So essentially, we're saying, before we press a nuclear button and we go to international arbitration, we spend all this money, let's see if we can, we can try and resolve this through, through, through a more um, alternative form of dispute resolution. Now, there are some issues here, and, and I'm going to look at them, in, 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 and there, are some, there is some advice. There's some advice that, that we, we probably should, we should be we should we should be considering when we're looking at these kind of these, these kind of tiered dispute resolution provisions. The first thing is you want to avoid one party abusing abusing negotiation um, mediation process as a means of delaying the arbitration. So make sure you have strict um, and short deadlines. This ensures that the, the, the negotiation phase or the mediation phase is 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 is, um, is, is met, and 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 really, what we're trying to say there is that once you once you agree to go to negotiation, let's go to negotiation. Let's try and get it over and done with. If, if you're not able to settle it, let's not waste any more costs. Let's take the take the dispute to arbitration and try and settle it that way. Also, make sure that the arbitration um, is. It, the arbitration is mandatory, not optional. So, f f following any conclusion of the su unsuccessful negotiation or mediation, you, you want to use the word shall, not may. Ted alluded to that uh, earlier. You, do, you don't want to say if there's unsuccessful negotiation, you may take it to arbitration. It, it needs to be obligatory, and that that removes any any kind of challenge from one party or, or, or the other, and it provides that the that, that the, uh, the the tribunal does have a just jurisdiction to hear a dispute. Should the parties not be able to um, successfully settle their their dispute by um, by alternative means, and also another um, best practice is is to require executives with decision making authority to engage in the nego negotiations. I was involved in in in, in one. Um, dispute where it had a, a, a tiered dispute resolution uh, provision, and we we turned up to to, to to the negotiation, and actually we 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 found that the the, the people on the other side didn't at, couldn't settle the dispute conclusively. They had to go back and ring head office. They had to deal with other executives, and that took a took a long time um, to try and get to to tr to try and get to any um, a, a position that the both parties could agree on. So that's that's something that you should really ha have in your in your clause, and ensure when you're um, agreeing to negotiate or, or, or mediate that the parties on the other side are able to to to, to demonstrate or at least to to to, um, to 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 clearly set state that they have um, authority to settle on on the day. So mandating legal fees to prevailing party. Legal costs, of course, is always a big, big issue for clients. And, and in arbitrations, particularly if they're complex, um, legal fees can be quite, quite significant. So under most arbitration arbitration rules, the arbitrators have, have discretion, but not, but not obligation to order the losing party to pay uh, attorney's fees and other costs of, of the successful party. Now, so what we what we want to try and do here, we want to try and in, in introduce some language into the arbitration provisions, um, which which provide that the, um, the the winning party will have their will be able to recover their their, their reasonable um, costs, and and this this acts in, in in many ways. First of all, it makes it it makes it clear that um, you will get your costs if you win. Secondly, it it, it acts as a chilling chilling factor. To frivolous arbitrations and frivolous claims, a party will will necessarily think twice about um, advancing and proceeding with um, a, a frivolous claim if they know that they they're, they're going to have to pay um, the, the the opponent's costs. And, we, and we've put some 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 language together in the example, as you can see, which 
which, which would be best, best, best practice to use when we're talking when we're, to, when we're talking about trying to allocate um, recovery of legal le legal fees, and and you can see that on on the slide. So consolidation and joinder now. Many considerations, and, and I think it just gets even more complicated and nuanced because what you're trying to do in, in, a, in an arbitration um, dispute provision is to try and anticipate what, what, might ha what may happen and try and, as much as possible, manage uh, those, those risks to ensure, as we said earlier, that the expenses minimise and you still have an effective arbitration um, award at the end of it. So, um, so consolidation and joinder. Now, arbitration tends to be a, 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 a tends to, tends to involve quite complicated disputes at times. But arbitration is, a, is is consensual. So a problem arises when there are m more than two parties who are not party to the same arbitration agreement, and that's a, essentially the issue in relation to consolidation and joinder. Consolidation it concerns. Um, um, consolidating existing proceedings. When we talk about joinder, we, 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 we talk about um, joining parties to, to, to proceedings. So in, to, in relation to consolidation, that would generally apply in a multi-contract situation where you have one, tra one, con one transaction um, with more than one contract, possibly binding different parties. So a distribution a, a, a arrangement where you, where you have different parties all part of, a, of, of one transaction. Uh, joinder, on the other hand, relates to multi-party, where you have actually one contract, but you have potentially have more than more than two parties. Uh, and as we'll see later, that this brings up some some quite significant issues with in, re in relation to the arbitration arbitration process. So the aim the aim really is to avoid multiple proceedings and inconsistent awards. And that's really that's really where we what we're trying to get to, and that what we're trying to um, legislate against by drafting. So consolidation provisions. So most sophisticated corporate transactions involve mul multiple related contracts, um, and there, there tends to be a commonality across these different contracts. You can have a master agreement and an ancillary, ancillary agreement. However, without express agreement of the parties. Disputes under related contracts will, will be heard by different arbitration tribunals. And of course, as, as we say in the slide, the dangers are, well, it becomes very expensive, and then you have um, inconsistent awards on the same issue, and this can really be, really, really can raise some significant issues for, for, for the parties involved. So what's the solution then? Well, you, what you do is you have consolidation provisions, and you include those in your agreement. Um, so consolidation provisions, uh, um, in terms of international institutional consolidation rules, so in a lot of the institutional rules, TED mentioned ICC, um, LCIA, for example, all of, a lot of the international arbitration uh, um, rules have consolidation provisions in there, but it's not always um, sufficient because you, 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 there, there are some conditions which have to be met and which won't, won't be met in, in 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 every situation. So, for example, under under the, the IT under the ITC rules, um, it permits consolidation either where the parties have agreed, that's Article 10, or a claim is made under the same arbitration agreement, or there's the same legal relationship, or the arbitration agreements are compatible. So to get over those hurdles can be quite difficult, and this, this is why um, it's best advice is to think about the type of transaction you're, you're involved with. Think about whether consolidation will be necessary, and think about how to how to make that consolidation work. Now, join the provisions. This is the other side, and joinder really relates to uh, when you have multi parties, and, and the problem here is, is 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 one of equal treatment. So where you have an appointment of a tribunal by more than two parties, the issue is how to ensure party autonomy and all parties contribute to the tribunal appointment process. Now, as you can see there in, in the first bullet point, I referred to a case, and this is the Siemens versus Duckco, which is which is quite a, a, a quite a, a famous dispute in relation to this issue of joined the provisions of multi-party. And essentially, this, this case concerned 
um, an ab ICC arbitration in which there were two respondents and one claimant. Now, the claimant appointed its arbitrator, but the ICC court insisted that the two respondents should jointly appoint a single arbitrator, and then we have the third arbitrator to be appointed by the ICC court. Now, the French court subsequently annulled the award of the ICC tribunal, finding that the procedure for the appointment of the arbitrators provided for in the ICC rules gave rise to inequality because one party, in this case, that was the claimant, had a greater influence on the makeup of the tribunal than the other parties. So you can see what, what kinds of issues arise here. <clears throat> so what we're talking about here, we're talking about that we want to ensure that there's a possibility for a defendant to join a third party, potentially to claim a contribution or indemnity. Now, the international arbitration rules, again, they have provisions that deal with um, a joinder, but those provisions don't always go far enough. And, and, and I've put, I've, you can see um, Article 7 of the ICC rules, uh, Article 22 of the LCIA rules, all deal with, all, all deal with, with, with um, joinder, but we, you, you, you can't always rely on those rules, so you, you need to be thinking about the type of disputes and the kind, the kind of issues which may arise, which you may have to deal with where you might need to join another party and try and introduce some drafting language which, which, which deals with that. So, another consideration is, 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 is discovery. Now, uh, historically, discovery in such arbitration has been, has been traditionally quite limited. There's been no dispositions, depositions, no, no targeted document requests, etc. But times are changing. You have, uh, you know, proliferation of, 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 of digital data, digital documentation, which, which has meant, and in multiple places, which has meant that it's much, it's much harder to, first of all, more, more, more documents are, are produced and generated, and it's much harder to, to narrow down the particular documents you're, you're, you're looking at because they, they, they may be in different places and they may cover lots of different things. So what we need to think about then, because of this, 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 this trend to have a more expansive discovery in arbitration, is look at ways to lower the cost by narrowing the discovery. So actually, while the, 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 the data set is increasing, we want to think about ways in which we, could, we can de decrease and narrow and make, and make discovery much more focused. And, and some of those um, some of those approaches are capping the number of document requests. So let's let's not let's make those requests focused, and let's not make them um, too too many. Um, no privilege logs. Uh, also eliminate eliminate expensive e-discovery requirements like the production of metadata. Anyone who's been in, involved in collating data knows that it, it can get very complex, it's multi-layered. So let's try and limit that and, and write that into an, an arbitration uh, agreement or decide it with the with the parties uh, once once the once once the arbitration uh, has 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 commenced. One best practice um, approach is to use. Um, the IBA rules on taking evidence. Now that, this is a international bar associations. Um, you could say it was a, a flagship document, really, which looks at trying to bridge the gap between the, the civil law and common law approach of discovery, and, and is trying to adopt best practice in in taking evidence and in discovery. And that's always a very um, good, good good thing to introduce into your dispute resolution provision. So the parties at one at one point are very are limited in, 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 in the manner in which they can they can approach discovery. Thank you, Joseph. That was very helpful. Um, we're obviously run out of time. I just want to make a final couple final points. Um, look, um, arbitrators again they, they derive their authority from the contract. So if you're drafting a dispute resolution provision, an arbitration provision, there's an endless, you know, what numbers of procedures you can add uh, or remove to decrease the expense. I mean, you're basically God when you are drafting an international arbitration clause. You can, you you are you are preparing the landscape that will govern the future dispute. Think think ahead. Think about your client. If there is a dispute under a contract. Is your client most likely to be the claimant or the respondent? 
uh, what, what, what is necessary to ensure that your client will indeed have an enforceable dispute uh, resolution mechanism, you got to think ahead. And, 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 I, and I believe that, that if you follow what we said, a lot of what we said, you go a long way towards, uh, towards lowering the risk of, 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 of international proceedings and, and the cost uh, if those proceedings arise. So we, we are, end, at end of time, we have a number of questions and we, we really apologize to those who asked the questions because we did not have the time to answer them, but we are gonna separately answer uh, your questions directly by email, I, I have read them. Um, we also like to say that if anyone else has any questions, you should just feel free to uh, send the emails to us. Our, our emails are on the front page of the, of the slide and we'll be happy to answer them directly. So thanks again for your patience and your time today. I hope you found this uh, uh, enjoyable.